My name is James and I'm here to talk to you about the case that stopped a $2 million jackpot. I'd just like to thank you all for having me. Uh, my colleague and I are from Australia and uh, we're over here looking at setting up a new office in Bucharest. And uh, the company that I work for, or the business that I work for, is Chum Casino. It's an online casino uh, for the US market. And tonight I'm going to tell you a little bit of, of a story. And that story is about a game called Stampede Fury. Stampede Fury is a uh, fire shot jackpot. What that means is that every bet that the customer makes contributes to this grand jackpot. So uh, if they bet $5, maybe a few cents of their bet go into this jackpot pool and increment it. We released this game uh, mid last year and the jackpot was seated at about 100,000 US dollars. The jackpot grew and grew. Here it uh, is $500,000, grew to $1.89 million, and then one day it stopped. The first indication that there was a problem was in our app server monitoring. This is New Relic. You can see that we've got a bit of a spike in application performance. The next indication we got that there was a problem came from our users on Facebook and Twitter. We can see here that someone's reporting that they saw someone in the casino hit grand jackpot. And this user is actually saying, when I was buying, thank you, sorry, is that better? I swear I was playing and something popped up that someone with a name that starts with N won the grand on Stampede and then the whole site froze and I couldn't log back in. And then when I did log back in, the grand was still there and no one had won it. So we are, at this point we jump into action. We pulled down the game. We put up a Facebook wall post that said that uh, explained what was happening. We prepared a statement for customer service. And we corrected and reset jackpot balance, corrected the user's balance, corrected the in-game win ticker, and contacted the affected customer. And then the investigation began. What went wrong? Before we talk about what went wrong, I'm going to go into the design of the system. This is a slot machine. When the, when the user hits the spin button, we send a, rep, a web request to the server, and the first thing it does is it begins a database transaction. We then check and update the funds, so we check that the user has the available balance to make the bet, and we update those funds. We then play the machine. Uh, so we roll the dice, we work out what the result's gonna be. We store that in a play history table, we commit the transaction, and we return the results to the user. Jackpot games are a little different. They have this uh, progressive uh, growing amount at the top of the game. Essentially, the, uh, the handling of the request starts off the same. Only after committing the uh, machine results, we then increment the player's jackpot contribution. So we take a fraction of their bet and we add it into the pool for that player. And then we get an updated jackpot value to return to the customer to update what they're seeing on the screen. I just want to go into the design of this jackpot table. So the jackpot design, the jackpot table has a key, which uh, is really uh, to do, this relates to the game and the, the size of the jackpot that they're playing for. They have a user ID and a value. This is the amount that this customer, user, 10,000, or oh, sorry, 100,001. This is how much they've contributed to the jackpot over time. There's two main access patterns. Firstly, when we increment the jackpot for this user, we find their row, and then we increment. To read from the jackpot, we find all of the rows for the grand jackpot, and we sum. 
The write is very fast. It takes a row lock per user, so it's quite scalable. The read is comparatively slow. We're talking about half a second, and it's a comparatively heavy CPU utilization. So if we plot it on a graph, uh, the, the increment jackpot is very high frequency, very low cost. The read is also high frequency, but it's higher cost. So what we want to do is introduce a cache that means that we only compute or query the jackpot uh, maybe once every second and share that value for all the users. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, so we introduce a cache and I'd like to go into the design of that. It goes something like this. We receive a request to get the jackpot value. We check if it's cached. If it isn't, we retrieve it from the database, store it in our cache and return it to the user. We then get a second, a second request. It now is cached. We check if it's expired. If it hasn't, we return it to the user. Maybe a, minute, a second later, we get a request, check if it's cached, it's now expired, retrieve it from the database, populate the cache, return it to the user. This is C-sharp code. If you squint, it kind of looks like Java or type, uh, JavaScript or TypeScript. Um, but I, although this is, I understand this is Bucharest JS, uh, you might be looking at C-sharp code, but everything I talk about and all of the lessons learned from this relate to server-side JavaScript programming as well. Um, and if anyone has any, wants to challenge me on that or ask any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. So this is a typical data access layer. This is for reading uh, the jackpot value that we spoke of earlier. To create our cache, we could introduce a dictionary like this, an if statement to check if uh, the cache contains the key that we're looking for, and we've got our code to populate the cache. We've not yet addressed the expiry. To do this, we might create an envelope type of T uh, with an expiry date and some logic to determine if it's expired. We can then put that into our dictionary or map and we've now got some expiry logic. At this point, I'd just like to talk about this. This code here is very specific to like our business case, whereas everything else is like generic caching code. So I think there's an opportunity for generalization here. I've got an example of how that might be done. We create a cache of t key, t value. This accepts a function, which is a factory, in this case, a database query to load the data. And when it, when it needs to, I can call that. We've got all of our components as before. And the usage might look something like this. There's one extra thing I want to talk about. Uh, sorry, the reason I'm telling you this and I'm showing this code, um, I'm not like, trying to teach you how to build a cache or I'm not trying to suggest that you should all build your own caches. Uh, in JavaScript there's memcache, in .NET we've got concurrent collections and in Java we have Guava. I'm just trying to like explain uh, the logic behind the caching. I think looking at some code helps. There's one thing we've not addressed yet which is concurrent access to the cache and it goes something like this. We get a web request in, it's not cached, we go to the database, we send it a query. We now get a second web request. We check it's cached, it's not, we send another query to the database. If we recall, the whole reason we put this in place in the first place was because we wanted to manage the CPU utilization of executing this query, and we're not doing that. What we really want to do if we look at the code, and we can see why this is. At this point, we've not yet updated our cache, and we've got a second thread come in, it checks the value, it executes the same database query. What we want to be able to do is really synchronize the access to this code 
Uh, in C-sharp, we talk about putting a lock in place, and it works something like this. And essentially, we'll only allow one thread at a time into this critical section. This is syntactic sugar for this. And in Java, it looks something like that. this. It's uh, the same sort of pattern. In C, C++, this is called a mutex. Uh, in JavaScript, you would do this a little differently because you don't want to block your request thread. So you would create a queue or an async block that calls you back when the cache is ready. Uh, hope that makes sense. I just want to talk a little bit about how locks work. There's two main types. C Sharp, Java, we're talking about a spin lock. The way that works is that it executes a compare and swap or exchange operation, which uh, essentially tries to write a value and compare it in an atomic operation. If it fails, it spins. It literally like just spins for a CPU cycle and it tries again. Uh, most spin locks have an algorithm where they'll back off to a lower power spin mode. Uh, most modern processors support this concept and essentially allows it to spin without using as much power. But essentially it's just keep, keeps trying to acquire the lock until it does. When it does, it continues. Async locks, they work a little differently. This is the sort of thing you would see in JavaScript. They say, I need access to a resource, call me when it's ready. And when it's ready, they execute the callback. You would see this in JavaScript if you've got like a database connection pool or something like that. Okay, so back to our code. We've now introduced a lock. The way this works is we have our three threads and you can see how they step through and we manage access to our cache. Okay, so we're back in the game. What happens when we win the jackpot? It's very similar to before, but after incrementing the jackpot, we now retrieve our value in a consistent manner. We have to bypass the cache, because at this point, our customers won the jackpot, we need to know not the cash value, but exactly how much they've won. We then claim the jackpot from the table. We then finally get the latest jackpot value, which should now be the reseeded version of the jackpot, because we want to reset this amount at the same time as we're telling them how much they've won. Any questions? I'll just dive into what it means to claim the jackpot. If we go back to our database design. What it in fact does is it deletes all of the contributions to date for the jackpot. So it seeks based on this key, deletes the values, happy days. Back to our chart. This operation is slightly more expensive than our query but it's much less frequent. It happens once per hour on a really small jackpot for the big one that we're talking about once a month, maybe once every three, four, five, six months. So what went wrong? When we started di diagnosing the problem, we looked at the database. This was one of the first things that stood out. This is a, a plot of the connections to the database from our application server. We've got this interesting spike. So we start thinking, well, do we have an issue with deadlocks or our database connection pooling? We looked at the database logs. We were lucky in that we had everything being logged in, in, in Postgres. So uh, we were logging all of our share locks. Every query being executed to the database is being logged. What you can see here is there's a process waiting on a share lock and after 100 milliseconds it still hasn't acquired it. We've in fact got a number of processes in this wait queue. A little bit further down in the logs we start seeing that this started growing and that was a pattern that sort of kept repeating itself. This is only a few milliseconds later. What we could do is parse these logs and build a lock graph Essentially, the way that works is we have two, two, three processes here. These two are blocked by another process. This one's blocked by uh, a fifth process. 
and that if we keep tracking this, we can find that they're blocked by a common process, and that's probably where we need to start looking. Our lock graph was much bigger than this, but conceptually, it's the same sort of diagnostic process that you need to go through. When we, when we went and looked at what this process was doing, we could see that it was executing the delete statement. So this is our claim jackpot operation. It took 600 milliseconds, so that's good. But on the very next line, five minutes later, we can see that this transaction rolled back. So the next thing we went to is look at our sequence diagram. And what does this do after claiming the jackpot? It tries to read from the cache. So at this point, we were sort of surmising that perhaps there's an issue with our cache. So we looked in the app server logs. And in the app server logs, we've got our spin lock in a parked state. And after five minutes, our transaction reaper in Wildfly, this was a Java server, by the way, has kicked in, called a board on the thread, and caused the transaction to roll back. So I'd just like to talk about deadlocks. So we have resource one, resource two, process A, process B. The simplest deadlock occurs when resource one is assigned to process A, resource two is assigned to process B, A is blocked waiting for resource two, B is lock, blocked waiting for resource one. So we started thinking about these types of scenarios and whether we could apply them to our problem. Sorry, I'll wait for the photo. All right, so we thought, well, our database is a resource and it has database locks in it. We also have this app server cache and it's got a lock in it. And this doesn't have to be a lock, uh, just on the JavaScript, this can be a queue. A queue and a lock in this context are both resources and you'll see that later. So we thought, well, we know our claim jackpots are deleting from the, the, the database, so it's taking row locks. But our uh, app server, our cache, it only executes a select statement. It doesn't take row locks, so why would it be being blocked? Uh, Postgres uses a recommitted snapshot isolation level, and a select requires an access share lock. The only thing that typically creates an access exclusive lock is when you change the table structure, like adding a column or changing a name something like that, a data type. So we're pretty sure this wasn't happening. And because we were logging everything that was executing on the database, we could kind of prove that this wasn't the case. One thing that we hadn't really addressed yet was this spike. So I'd just like to talk about that. This is kind of like a simple explanation of how a connection pooling works in a server. So we might have multiple requests coming into our node or job server. We have a pool of connections, and it's basically virtualizing a small number of physical connections to our large number of requests. Uh, and the reason for that is so that when a request comes in, there's kind of a connection they're waiting for. We don't have to wait for that handshake to take place with the database. In general, it works very well. In this case, though, what we suspected was happening was that connections were growing until this was uh, this pool was being exhausted. In fact, there are many resources here uh, that could potentially be, be exhausted. We have limits on the connection pool in memory. We have limits on the connection pool on the database server. We have an operating system here with sockets and uh, other sorts of resources. So we thought that maybe there was some sort of resource exhaustion. Let's see how that might work. So now instead of just having two resources, we have our cache, we have our database connections, and our database lock, and we believe it works something like this. Our claim jackpot deletes from the, the uh, jackpot rows and takes row locks. We have our other players trying to increment uh, their contribution to the jackpot. They are now blocked. They're being assigned database connections. And there's lots of players using this system. There's hundreds of players all clicking spin. So what happens is the pool starts introducing more connections uh, on both servers. Uh, the pools are slowly being exhausted. 
will actually quite quickly be exhausted. Uh, our application cache expires. A player uh, reads through that to refresh, and they can't get a database connection. By this time, our claim jackpot uh, request goes to get the cache value, and it is now blocked. <coughs> Does anyone have any questions? All right, so the solution. This is kind of the first thing we came up with, and there's lots of ways of solving this problem, uh, but we thought this had like the most bang for buck. And I'm gonna talk about a lot of lessons and possible solutions here. So what we did, we moved from a read-through cache design to a refresh ahead cache. The way this works is we have a background worker on a timer that is constantly refreshing the cache, maybe once a second. And every time a request comes in, it hits the cache, immediately retrieves the value, it never blocks, returns it to the customer. If we look at a simple implementation for this, the first block here is responsible for the timer and the refreshing of the cache. The bottom piece of code here is what our consumers run when they need the value. There's a bit of a problem here. This is somewhat of a naive uh, implementation. Does anyone want to guess what the problem is? Uh, the first problem uh, is this is calling the database in a loop, but that's not actually the problem I'm worried about here. The problem here is uh, if we now start receiving a timeout uh, error or some other sort of exception executing this database query, it's a little bit of a concern because we've got this timer running. We're not sure what that's going to mean in terms of updating our cache on time. Uh, so we need some other way of monitoring that. So what we did is we put some instrumentation in place that tells us how frequently the jackpot is updated successfully. Uh, does it ever happen slowly? Like, does it take more than one second? And does it ever error? And in fact, on this chart, you can see there's an issue between the 25th and the 26th where there was like a, a request, one request that took more than a second, and there was like a dip in uh, update throughput as a result. So like, uh, in summary, this, this solution is nice because it never blocks. It's a simple design. It has a predictable database overhead, but it does require some additional monitoring. I'd just like to now move on to some locking guidelines. We've talked a lot about locks. I think wherever I say locking guidelines, you can replace locking with queuing. Wherever you have a queue in JavaScript, the same guidelines apply. So I'd just like to talk about this. You can see this is a bit like a queue. If we plot the latency of our requests, uh, when we look at the zero to maybe the 50th percentile, what we see is very sort of near linear uh, perf performance. Uh, we're just looking at a read through cache with a one second expiry, taking 500 milliseconds to refresh. What we see after the 50th percentile is something more like this. And essentially what's happening here is the 51st percentile is hitting the cache, it's not ready, it's being read from the database, but it arrives shortly afterwards. These guys are a little less lucky, so they're maybe hitting the cache halfway through its population, and these unlucky customers are the guys that are pretty much populating the cache and paying the full cost of that. So like uh, in terms of app server performance, we're gonna have terrible, uh, we might have an okay average performance here, but in terms of like uh, 70th, 90th, 95th, 99th percentile, we have a pretty average performance. So the first uh, guideline that I would have is to reduce lock scope. Um, that, this also applies to whatever your queuing is doing in JavaScript. There's some other recommendations I would have for this though. Uh, it relates to this finally block. Can anyone else think why it might be a good idea to reduce lock scope? If it's cached, then you, you don't have to wait for the other threads. 
Yeah, so performance is the main one, I would say, but there's another one I'm thinking of. Uh, I'm thinking about exceptions. So the whole purpose of our sync block here is to help protect the integrity of this resource. And the more code we put in there, the, uh, the, the, the I guess, the, the higher the probability of an exception occurring. Like the more logic, uh, the more tasks we put in there, the larger the variety of exceptions and they become harder to handle. So I would say my first guideline is to reduce log scope uh, to prevent queuing, but also to reduce the possibility of exceptions, which would it makes it easier to implement rollback behavior. I'll summarize these at the end, by the way. My second guideline, I'd like you to imagine a scenario where you've got a water slide, and to get to the water slide, you need two things. You need a ticket and a uh, an inner tube that you can sit in, okay? Now imagine that the lines for these two things are separate. So you can go to one and get a ticket, go to the other getting the inner tube. You could have a scenario where people go to both, they get all the tickets and all the inner tubes, and then go to the other, and they can't get an inner tube or a ticket. This is a deadlock, okay? So what we do is we order the access to the slide so that you have to get your ticket before you get your inner tube, the problem goes away. So the second guideline is to have a lock or queue ordering policy. In practice, how you would implement that is something like this. So we might have data, database connections, caches, database reads and writes. If we just create a, an order for this, and it can be any order in fact, and ensure that we always do those things in order, we will never have a deadlock. And in fact, we can skip things and we'll still never have a deadlock. What we can't do is do this in the reverse order. And our previous design didn't take this into account. The third guideline I've got relates to this piece of code here inside our cache. What we're doing in here is we're inverting control. I don't know if you're familiar with that term, but wherever we sort of have some framework code or uh, logic that inverts to user code, uh, we essentially sort of lose control. And this would, in fact, undermine uh, our, our, our previous two guidelines, which is to reduce the scope of the lock and impl uh, implement lock ordering because the, we don't know what's in that code and it could essentially break our rules there. So number three, avoid inversion of control while holding a lock or indeed within, uh, if you're processing a queue. Finally, I'd just like to talk about what happens here. Uh, this would be the same with an async lock if you're trying to get a database connection from a pool. Essentially, this will just wait forever. What would be better is if we implement a timeout. And in C Sharp, the monitor API allows you to do this, but if you've got a, a, some JavaScript code with an async lock, always have a timeout. Finally, Cache selection. So I read through cache. I think this is suitable in cases where your data can't fit in memory and you have unpredictable access patterns. An example of this would be a CPU where we have a level one, a level two, a level three cache, where we want the, the program or the activity of the user to dictate what information we take from our uh, a hard drive or a database and load into our local cache. This is nice because we don't have a separate background process to man manage, but it does mean there's going to be blocking or request queuing. Our refresh ahead cache, conversely, is better when we have a predictable access pattern and we can fit all the data in memory. In our case, we just had a few bytes that we wanted to always be in memory uh, there was never a scenario where we didn't want those to be in, in, in our cache. This gives us better performance. It never blocks or queues callers, but we have the additional overhead of uh, monitoring our background process. See, in summary of lessons learned, logs have really good logs. If you have a database in your application stack, I would recommend logging every query that's issued to that database. Uh, even in like 
In fact, the more secure or precious that environment is, the better reason for you to lock the uh, request to work from an auditing perspective. <coughs> Locking guidelines, scope should be as small as possible. Locking slash queuing guidelines. Uh, have an ordering policy for caches, queues, pulls, and locks. Avoid OIC while IOC while holding a lock. And consider timeouts for all of these things as well. Our cache selection, understand why you're adding the cache, select the right cache for the job. Don't just throw Redis at the problem and load test your cache. Uh, we did load test this application, but not sufficiently enough. And uh, once we ran into this issue, after about a week of additional load testing, we were able to reproduce it in a test environment. Resources, uh, I would recommend, if you want to learn more about this stuff, I would read uh, Joe Albahari's got a free ebook. It says threading, but I would say it's really just about concurrency. And even if you're in JavaScript environment, I would, I would say that this is super valuable to read. It teaches you all sorts of queuing semantics and uh, lock-free programming and all of this sort of thing. Anyway, the story had a happy ending. Uh, this is a photo of Donalyn receiving a $1.89 million check from Chumba Casino. And uh, at this point, I'd just like to thank you all for having me, and I'll turn it over for Q&A. It's waiting. Yeah, we have some food. Maybe we can discuss. Uh, yeah, uh, cool. We are quite hungry. <laughs> some food, so, thank you. Don't go home after that because we have another uh, talk uh, uh, waiting for us.